Namaste. So I want to talk about something <laughs> that is really, I mean, this is really esoteric. But it's actually accessible to everybody. It's one of those things that everyone feels, but perhaps they don't have the words to articulate it or the vocabulary that allows them to notice it, even for themselves. And that is the exquisite poignancy of existence. What, is me, what do we mean by poignancy? Huh? The word poignant has several definitions and a very interesting etymology that goes all the way back to Sanskrit. So let's take a look at that first. Poignant can mean sharp pointed or keen of a weapon or so. It can also mean neat, eloquent, relevant or applicable. And the interesting definition that we're talking about is evoking strong mental sensation to the point of distress, emotionally moving. Now, it can also mean piquant or pungent, as of a smell or taste, or incisive, penetrating of a look or words. And there are some other obsolete definitions. But the one we're interested in is that it invokes or evokes a strong mental sensation. I mean, that it's almost painful. Now, who has not gone out in nature and felt this? That there's this tremendous beauty, huh? in nature, or perhaps just behind nature. And yet, that beauty is often elusive and temporary, and sometimes can turn terrible in a moment, huh? like a beautiful animal that suddenly attacks you, you know? or the fact that we have to go through life knowing that we have to die. It's not that there's no beauty in life. There's a lot of beauty in life. But that beauty is always temporary. It's transient, huh? impermanent. So, at the same time, along with this, we have the ex extremely amazing experience of the self. The self is eternal, changeless, has no qualities of its own, and is the source of consciousness and everything else. So on the one hand, we have part of our experience rooted in the self, whether we realize it or not is another story, but as a matter of fact, we are all rooted in the self or we wouldn't exist. And then on top of that, we have overlaid the experience of the world and life, which is temporary, transient, Huh? Almost, but never quite perfect. And I would also go further. I would say there's another kind of piquancy, which is the possibility of beauty in life, which sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't happen. And we never know, do we? We never know if it's actually going to happen. I feel this very much in relationships, that there's this potential, there's this possibility of immense beauty 
But most of the time, we don't attain it. We don't experience it because of various conditions, blah, 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 right? Whatever. The point is, we go through life with this kind of exquisite poignancy of the beauty or potential beauty of life juxtaposed with its temporariness, its impermanence, its delicacy, its extreme delicacy. And I don't know, in, in Vedic terminology, I don't know any word for this. But the Japanese really get into this <laughs> as an aesthetic. Huh? The whole symbol of the cherry blossoms in Japan. The cherry blossoms bloom, and of course, they're very beautiful, light pink color. And just as the blooms, as the blossoms reach their perfection, they all fall, the petals fall. So the Japanese see the cherry blossom as a metaphor of the temporariness, the beauty or potential beauty and perfection of life, which even if it happens, then is impermanent. Right? And, and what gives this its special flavor is the fact that underneath this is the permanence and the unchangeability of the self, which is just pure awareness, not even consciousness, because in consciousness there's already a duality, there's already a subject, an object, but in, in pure awareness, there is no subject, no object, no perception, no feeling. No? I'm reminded of a Buddhist story, a, a sutta, a sutra, where well, one of the great disciples of the Buddha uh, is being asked, well, what is this... Uh, Samadhi, what is this nirvana that you talk about? Sariputta. Sariputta was asked this question. What is this nirvana? Is it the absence of everything? If so, how can that be pleasant? How can that be wonderful? Why is it praised so much to the skies? And yet it seems like the absence of everything. And Sariputta laughed and said, well, that's exactly what's beautiful about it, is that there is nothing felt. There's no perception. There's no subject-object duality. See, and so there, there is this exquisite kind of overwhelming feeling that is present in ordinary consciousness, is completely absent in that consciousness. There's nothing but bliss. And there's no counterpoint to that bliss. That's enlightenment. That's nirvana. Nibbana. Huh? The ultimate samadhi. So, there's a related question to this. How does it feel to be enlightened? <laughs> I've had people ask me this once or twice. And the answer is, the, the question is irrelevant because enlightenment means transcending feeling, transcending perception itself, transcending even consciousness, and just being pure awareness. Now, one cannot stay in samadhi all the time. Huh? At least not the kind of samadhi that means complete withdrawal from the senses. This is because every body has prarabdha karma. And even an enlightened person still has to experience their prarabdha karma, 
or the karma that belongs to this particular body. So they, they do so. They have to come out of samadhi. Maybe they teach, or maybe they go to different holy places, or they, they can do anything they want, actually. <laughs> but what they're doing is experiencing their prarabdha karma. So this is going on side by side, this juxtaposition of the eternal and perfect and pure with the temporal and imperfect with the knowledge that it will always change, it will always go away, it will always become something else. So the contrast between these two, I believe, is what generates this piquancy, huh? this sharp mental feeling. And it's very interesting huh? because the word poignant contains a variation of the spelling of gnan, jnana. Huh? And of course, jnana is self-realization. So the very word itself, which can be traced back to Roman times or even earlier, is that it's the juxtaposition, it's the contrast between the self and the world that causes this incredibly strong mental sensation. It's an actual aesthetic sensation. And this is also the foundation of rasa. So I'm very surprised that I have never found a Vedic term that corresponds to it. But yet, I tell you, I'm, I'm so blessed that when I get up in the morning and I see Arunachala overlooking my studio, <laughs> my house, you know, and I go outside and, you know, I feed the birds every day. So a lot of birds come and they're beautiful bird songs. And the beauty of the trees and nature and the animals, you know, I love animals. <laughs> I love cows and horses, especially. Oh yes, and cats. So all these beautiful things, huh? but they're all temporary. They're all changeable. Their beauty lasts for a few days only. Huh? Just like life. Our life is beautiful. We love it so much, we cling to it. Yet this life is only for a few days and then it goes away. So what to do? How to deal with this? Well, I think the Japanese have the right idea that they define this as the highest beauty. Not necessarily a beautiful thing, huh? but the fact that its beauty is transient makes it all the more appreciated while it's present. See, and, and this leads, this connects directly with the worship of the mother because the mother is the beauty, the unborn potential and actual beauty in everything in the universe. And this is why the universe exists, actually. Uh, so, again, we have the universal mother as the embodiment as the incarnation of the beauty underlying everything, which is the contrast between the eternal and the temporary, between the deathless and the mortal, between the self and the world. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung.